Chapter 36. Sorry. Mist wrapped itself around the school. It threaded through the skeleton trees that lined the driveway and clung to the forest frost-bitten bushes opposite them. Very early in the morning, there is sometimes mist in the forest. It lifts in waves like a long-tailed bird forced into the open. Forced to reel it, the nest it wanted to hide. The scent of forest and damp earth rise up with the mist. Grandma never allows them out of the compound until the mist has gone. She tells stories of people who lose their way because of it. Stories of Ewing, the tree sprouts who play wild games and make the wanderers scramble out of the woods with eyes flickering with madness on their tongues. Shade peered through the gloom ahead. She recognised a slim figure walking alone with her head bent forward covered by a scarf. She hurried to catch up with Marion. Please, can we go somewhere? There's something I need to tell you, Shade whispered, her heart pounded. The hall was hardly private. If Marcia and Donna were there, Shade did not want to see them. However, the noisy batches of students took no notice of them as they weaved their way towards an unoccupied corner. Marion turned to Shade with folded arms, her eyes, dark eyes waited, silently on guard. I stole for your uncle's shop, a lighter, a cigarette lighter. Shade watched for horror and disgust to change the silent face, but not a muscle seemed to move. Marion's gaze remained steady, as steadfast as Mama's eyes would have been. Marcia said her cousin would hurt my brother. Shade first to set, forced herself to continue. She and Donna came with me. I took the lighter while they kept talking to your uncle and... <sighs> her heart was flopping wildly. That lady is your mother, isn't she? Mariam nodded and Shade watched the navy blue headscarf ripple slightly. She recalled how the thin bony-faced woman in da endowed store had also stared at her in this guarded way. My mother, my uncle, they know about the lighter. Mariam's voice was so soft and flat that Shada was unsure she'd heard correctly. Marcia and Donna, they do the same to me. But you stop talking with me, like you don't want to be my friend. They, you all know, why didn't your uncle stop me? What did Marcia do to you? Shada's tongue felt dry and clumsy as her questions stumbled over each other. She ignored the shrill ringing over the tannoy. They make me steal. From uncle I must give them gold pen or do something bad, like fire. But I tell Mama and Uncle, and he gave me the pen. He say, let them think you steal it. People like that are no good. Don't fight them, just keep away. I give Marcia the pen, and they leave me alone. But now I see they start with you. Shade did not know what to say or where to look, so Mariam and her family had known all along. Papa would surely not have said the same as Mariam's uncle. How did people know what was the right thing to do? It was all so confusing. Yet she admired Marion for telling her mother and uncle at least they'd face their threats together. The hall was almost empty. Shade forced herself to look straight into Marion's face, the bell was ringing again. I'm sorry, she said. You told me all about your uncle and your mother. Marion had even spoken about her father's death in prison and her brother who was missing. I told you nothing. Marion's eyes seemed to soften. It's okay. Maybe you're worried about something, she said. Come. Morris had gone mad if we late. You see me at break? Mr. Morris was calling the register when he entered the class. Shardy expected him to say something cross or sarcastic. However, his gaze seemed to rest on her for an extra second like he was taking a snapshot on a slow shutter speed. He simply said, Ah, there you are. Marcia's narrowing eyes couldn't hide a flicker of surprise as Shardy followed Marion down the aisle. Was it at seeing them together again? Why don't you tell them off, sir? You tell us off if we come late. Donna's words were as spiky as a hair. Yes, I would, Donna, if only to hear whether your latest excuse was any better than your last. Mr. Morris's words produced muffled laughter and giggles. There even seemed to be some snorts from Kevin's desk. At the end of the register, Mr. Morris announced that the class could talk quietly among themselves until the bell. Then he signalled to Shade. I'd like a word in private with you, Shade. Telling you off in private, that's discrimination, that is. Donna hissed into Shade's ear. Do you want me, sir? I come late with Shade. Marion stood up with Shade. She was coming to her aid, despite everything. A friend in need, Mama would say. No, thank you, Marion. This concerns Shade only, said Mr. Morris. His eyes roamed the classroom. I shall be outside in the corridor. If your chattering lifts the ceiling, my Christmas present to you will be a detention. Shade followed Mr. Morris, feeling dull and numb. What now? Why did he have to notice her? She had more than enough to worry about already in her other life. 
If a teacher wanted to have words with her, she would quickly think of Iyawa sitting quietly at her desk at home. Iyawa who held up a graceful neck and lace patterned head so calmly that it used to soothe any butterflies in her stomach. She tried to think of her Iyawa now, but the only picture that came to mind was an Iyawa who was dried out, the wood split and cracked. The patterns on this Iyawa's hair were furrows eaten by termites. Shade bent her head in dismay. She felt herself crumbling. When Shade next opened her eyes, she was lying on a bed, staring at someone misty and fuzzy. Slowly, the figure of Miss Harcourt. There was no Mr. Morris, no class, no corridor. She was in a small room full of whiteness. White walls around her, white sheet beneath her, white screen at the end of the bed, white chair beside her. Miss Harcourt asked how she was feeling. Shade barely managed to nod. Everything about her felt heavy, most of all the tongue. She watched the teacher's silky chestnut hair swing lightly as she tilted her head. Ooh, you gave us quite a fright, passing out like that. Mrs. King is on her way now. Need a doctor, probably. But, un probably stress. We have no idea. Shade drifted in and out of listening. It seemed that the school now knew something about Papa. Did that mean they also knew about Mama? Did they know what happened to Mama after the ambulance men carried away under the blinding white sheet? She didn't know. She didn't know if Papa knew. She didn't even have a proper chance to ask him. If we'd known before, help, cope, Shade shut her eyes and ears. Aunt Grace's doctor came to the house and declared he could find nothing wrong with her. His eyes twinkled behind thick round glasses like those of a friendly brown owl. Once again, Shade heard the words cope. It must have been all too much to cope with Mrs. King, even for an adult. You know, it would be too much. What the child needs is rest, and you must encourage her to eat more. Aunt Gracie led, out, led the doctor out of the pineapple coloured bedroom to the door. I think she finds it hard, hard to eat because her father has stopped. The hushed tones trailed down the stairs out of Shade's hearing. Chapter 39 A Visitor There were only two more days until the end of term, and the doctor had ordered Shade to rest. This time, Femin didn't argue about staying off school. Shada thought he must be hoping that someone at school had seen him on television. She didn't want to think about her school or her class. She didn't want to think about anything or anyone. But when Aunt Gracie came up with juice and a bowl of cornflakes, she brought the news that Mama Apaya was coming to talk to her later in the afternoon. Mrs Apaya says you look so good on television. Like a star, she's sure this will help your daddy. Aunt Gracie was trying to cheer her up and that made Shadi more miserable. Mama Apaya would as well. She forced herself to eat a few cornflakes so that Aunt Gracie would feel as, as if she'd at least tried and that would take, make her take the bowl away. But she still didn't feel hungry at all. Most of the day, Shadi lay in bed listening to music on the little radio that Aunt Gracie had put on her desk. She tried reading a book from the school library, but it took too much energy to keep her eyes on the print, even to hold the book. At least the music filled her brain. Once, however, after she dozed off, she jerked awake, imagining a line of stick-thin people struggling across miles of sand. The figure in front held up his hands in a way that reminded her of someone. The picture came closer like a television camera moving in until she was forced to see it was Papa. At the head of the line of starving refugees, Papa was still talking with his hands. When the doorbell rang at about four o'clock, Shadow rolled over to face the wall again. Perhaps Mama Apaya wouldn't stay if she thought she was disturbing her. Aunt Gracie's voice rang like a warning bell on the stairs. It's very good of you to come. Shadow will be so pleased to see you, but only for a few minutes. Doctor says she needs plenty of rest. She may even be sleeping now. Shade waited to hear Mama Apaya's rich tones, but there was no reply. I have a visitor for you, Shade. Your friend has come to see you. Shade lay still. Your school friend. Shade lifted herself on her elbows. Beside, behind Aunt Gracie stood Marion. She held out a large white envelope. We make, we make a card for you. I say, I will bring it. Shade stared at it, but didn't reach out. How very kind of you, said Aunt Gracie. Isn't that kind of your class, Shade? Aunt Gracie took the envelope from Marion and handed it to her. I shall leave you girls together, but only for ten minutes, mind. Neither girl spoke as Shade slowly lifted the flap and pulled out a card with a spray of flowers and a get well soon on the front. A folded piece of note paper slipped out on the bed. She left it there while she examined the mosaic of names and messages. Underneath, hope you feel better, printed in the centre, someone had written, and that your daddy's free soon. 
She scanned the good looks, best wishes and see you soons. There were names she knew and others for which she didn't even know the faces, strangers to her. But then, tucked away in the bottom left hand corner, she stumbled upon, upon Love Marcia. Immediately underneath was Donna. Kiss, kiss, kiss. The liars. She could feel Marion waiting for her to say something. Her mouth felt completely dry. Perhaps some of the others also didn't mean what they said. Don't judge the village by the thief, Shade. If the dog steals, will you punish the goat? She forced her eyes to circle around the other messages. Mr. Morris and Miss Harcourt signed too. Finally, Rouse travelled to the message Marion, Marion had been waiting for her to see. My family wish you get well soon, Marion. Thank you. I've got something for you, but I have to finish it. She pulled out the Christmas cards and pens from the desk drawer. Marion sat on the edge of the bed while Shadow worked in silence, drawing a row of palm trees in the remaining blank space inside. Swift light brown strokes made sand. Underneath, in emerald green, she wrote, I hope one day you will be able to go home. She hesitated, wondering whether to add something about Marion's brother. Maybe it was better not to. Remembering him must be painful for them. Yet it was Marion who told Charlie about him, even about her father dying in prison. It was something she still had to learn, how to talk about Mama. She handed Marion the card, making herself explain that the front was a picture of their backyard at home. My brother Femi used those trees for his goals. My brother Hassan also, he's crazy about for, but football. But now, now I don't know anything. Aunt Gracie put her head round the door, reminding them of the time. Come whenever you like in the holidays, my dear, you'll be welcome. Myron's grave face opened into a lovely smile. She pointed to the letter on the bed. Maybe you like your letter. Morrissey say he is proud of someone from his class to do what you do. Shade picked up the piece of folded paper. You read, you see. I go now or my mother worry too much. Marion raised her hand to say goodbye but suddenly halted in midair. I nearly forget. Marcia and Donia, they in trouble. They have to see head teacher and they not come back to class this afternoon. People say someone, father from year seven, come to make big complaint. Marion said goodbye and was gone. Shade briefly remembered her fantasy of having Papa alongside her to tackle Marcia and Donna. It must have taken courage for that year seven child to ignore the threats, but she would rather not think of Marcia and Donna at all, certainly not now. She turned up the radio again and unfolded her letter. Dear Shade, all of us in ATEM want to send you our warmest wishes and we hope you will have a good rest over the Christmas holidays. Some of the class and myself saw you on the seven o'clock news at Monday. We've all been shocked to realise what you and your family have been going through. I feel somewhat guilty, as I fear you may have thought that you as I fear you may have thought that you were in some kind of trouble on Monday when I called you out to have a word in private. In fact it was the very opposite. After lessons on Friday, I received a telephone call from a producer of the school's programme, Making News. She told me how you and your brother had very bravely come forward to tell your father's story to the chief presenter of their channel's news. Apparently he was so impressed by you that he suggested the topic of refugees for a future Making News. They would like you and your brother, if you would like that, to take part. Class A Tam has also been invited to present an investigation for the same programme. Don't worry about deciding now. 8M doesn't know about the invitation and you shouldn't feel under any pressure. All I have told the class is you were responsible for getting your father's story reported. He must be very proud of you. We all are and can understand how worried you must still be about him. I should say that the idea to send you get well wishes came from members of the class themselves. But they also asked me especially to write that they feel very sad and troubled to hear about your mother's death. We all send you much sympathy to you and your brother. Yours sincerely, Duncan Morris.